um, there's a lot of people talking about NFTs, blockchain games, as a reference to how a digitalized world actually may be. Um, so, like, like, what is the true value in your eyes? What is it? Uh, what is the true value of NFTs um, from blockchain games, but also from the world, the real world? Okay, so uh, for me, the value of it is really in its permanence. Uh, financial value may change depending on, for example, aesthetics, uh, utility inside a game, or its desirability, collectability, provenance. Just the fact that this NFT exists, is permanent, can be looked up, and as long as the chain exists, it, it is actually there. It gives it an inherent uh, property of value. And how people want to expound on that value, make games out of it, uh, turn it into a collectible, turn it into digital art, there may, may be any, anything you can do with it. But as with physical items, that item is there, and until it's destroyed somehow, it, it exists permanently. Yeah, I think people are being very creative about how they add value to NFTs. So gaming is one way, right? Having a utility in the game is obvious, but I think there's a lot of other clever ways you can um, associate value with NFTs. Uh, an example um, from our site is we had a postal service in Austria um, send people digital stamps, and they were coupled with a physical stamp. So you could use a physical stamp um, to actually send mail, but then you also have this digital collectible, and that was an interesting way to sort of bootstrap the value of the digital asset. Other folks have actually tied physical assets directly to the NFT, so you're, you could be owning a pair of sneakers but trade it around digitally uh, before you even withdraw it physically. So there's a lot of other ways, but I totally agree with Gabby that uh, what's new here is the permanence and mutability of the blockchain that's being added. What else? Who wants to ask that? Well, I think we're all moving into a space where uh, people largely associate their online persona with a digital identity. Um, and there, for example, with Blockade, with Neon District, we have our founders, we have a thousand identified founders that are one through a thousand and uh, they're weighted. And so our interaction with these different founders, uh, those assets are tied to their account and we interact with them in a special way uh, online, like outside of the game. So um, there's that. There's the, did you want to tell the story about the passport? Uh, yeah, so we have this um, interesting NFT on OpenSea that was a passport for future liberation of North Korea. Uh, so we bought this. <laughs> if, uh, in that type of scenario, we would be able to enter the country. Um, so, it, you know, not, it, it wasn't very successful, but, um, you know, there's all sorts of, it, yeah, I guess the, the point is, it's just the design space is very wide. You could, any Anything that you might want to represent uh, digitally, you could. Um, so, I think, in some ways, we've always thought of it as much more exciting than uh, what we saw with ICO the token boom, because if you think about the number of tokens we actually use in our day to day life, it's mostly just cash, maybe airline points, maybe in-game currencies. We're not using a lot of fungible currencies on a day-to-day -day basis, but if you think about the number of digital and physical assets that we're using, there's tickets, domain names, game items, uh, really the, the wide range of things that you've ever done as well. Yeah, I think um, the, uh, the, I think the great thing about NFT is that you can kind of put value into it. Like you could create the new part the utility of purpose. Like, Likewise, our engine, our CTO, he put his um, marriage contract, uh, he created a token based on it. We had a little NFT event where a lot of people sent in their own images and pictures of a special memory that they wanted to keep as like, an NFT item, um, even like a proposal ring. But I think the beauty of NFT is its flexibility and how you can design a utility and tie it to a real life like, tangible value. I have a story for that. Um, so we did the founder sale. And my dad has a leg. Right? But he had founder's feet. So we redid the cover art. And it's like this animated picture now. And he's, he's, a, he's a game character, a legendary game character, and there's a war of it. So forever that he memorialized that, that, that event. And in the community, that has been forever. So that lore, and, and a lot of ways that community um, interaction gets tied into the game development. So 
uh, there's carryover into why different directions and choices were made. It's not for us. It's not just coming from the development team. And those stories will be something that um, involve people who cherish. So yeah, that explains a lot. Uh, we are all in the game industry, so let's talk on the let's focus on the game NFT. And uh, actually, uh, within the team, um, we are really uh, discuss a lot about this issue and this topic. When we make some kind of the source for the EOS night, we think about that. How much is it? And when we make some some green for the EOS night, we think that um, how much is it? But it's really hard to say, but it, uh, we reach it to be the really simple, uh, simple answer that uh, the value of that uh, NFT and the item of the NFT is decided by uh, whether the game is fun or not. That's the fundamental value of that, and it's reporting the game. So, yeah. um, actually, this brings back to the, the small talk we were having uh, while we're waiting for this panel. Um, do you want to go into that, or uh, so? Before this panel, um, Gabby was pointing out that in 2017, no, 18, 17, I personally said I don't believe in blockchain games. It's so, true. If you so scroll down, down this Facebook, yeah. that. <laughs> but um, but what what I said when I said that, what I really meant was that pre-sale of NFTs before the game actually comes out does not have any intrinsic value because the NFT items are. Uh, paired with the game itself. So selling a item as a pre-sale before the game comes out um, is something that I do not believe in, was uh, the underlying um, information I wanted to present. But Gabby pointed that out in front of everyone, and in front of every, everyone here now. But, um, but that uh, became like a 20 minute discussion within the room, and I think it's kind of worth sharing. Um, like, could you share a little bit of the points that you were mentioning within the room? Um, back there, anyone? Um, what do you think about this? Okay, uh, I'll start because we we just did a pre-sale for our game Battle Racers. So we've been working on the game for around a year now, and we did not do the pre-sale until we actually had a bit bet, uh, beta of the game up and running, and people were going to play it. So of course you can run a pre-sale anytime you want, and depending on your marketing, it may be successful even if you don't have a game out. So in that way, it's similar to an ICO as well. You can raise a lot of money on marketing alone, but you're not sure whether you can really deliver the product maybe one or two years later. So uh, for us, we wanted to make sure that we already had the gameplay that we wanted. And we could show it to people, and they could play it, and it was fun. And this was something we could demonstrate to them, even though the game was not fully live. And that contributed a lot to the success of the pre-sale. Because even though the game was not yet fully launched, they were able to play it, and it was fun. And it gave them a lot more confidence buying the items themselves. Yeah, I think the space has matured a lot over the last year where when people tried to run these pre-sales, they tried to create games that just looked like perfect games, but you know, it's some sort of twist. Like the first wave of people were some people bought into it, but after, you know, even after a couple of months, people got smart and, and now I think in order to run a pre-sale you do have to demonstrate that you're, there's, there's some game out there, you're, you're building something legitimate and it's interesting. But I think, I don't necessarily know if that means having something live. Um, a good example that uh, I like to point to is Decentraland. Um, they have a quality team, they have an established roadmap, um, and the, the, the land is liquid, so people can buy into it and flip it. And a lot of the folks who did buy into the Decentraland auction did and they're profiting. So they took a risk, uh, that was their decision, um, and they paid out for them. So I, I don't know, I, I think it's, I, I don't think there's any hard and fast rule about what stage your game has to be. I think it's brand new territory. Um, there's gonna be a lot, there's gonna be a whole industry around figuring out whether these products are legitimate or not in the same way that we saw that maturation happen with ICS. And Margaret, do you have anything to share? <laughs> yeah, I um, so, at, when we were discussing back there, I was thinking about how, you know, each has really struggled with fundraising, just in general. Um, and the ability to show revenue or show appetite is something that studios have to strive for in order to then attract the investments, which then can help with the development. Um, 
And so this is a way where you should, I think, ethically, responsibly have to potentially get creative in how do you uh, play with the NFT, which uh, can give us some funding initially and um, which to move to investment, but how can we do that in a way that's not putting all the risk on the user? Like, what are we selling them? Are we selling them an empty promise that this thing is going to be valuable, or are we selling them an either making experience they can participate in right now? That was one of the choices we made at Blockade was with those founders fees I was talking about, when we issued them, there's 100,000, um, people bought them for $5 each, all of them the same, it was a gamified wait list, people, like 14,000 people competed to be in the top 1,000, it was a mix of social influencers and whales. And so, then when that 1,000 were locked in, they were allowed to buy the $5 fee. And, um, and those are ranked now for them. Um, but what that allowed them to do was have access to the early builds and work with the development team to a private forum that they contribute and listen to their input. And um, you can't even play the bill without the key. It has to be in the wallet. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it has a security element to it. Um, and those players, like the cheapest key is not $30. So everyone who participated. I see, sold mine for around $150. Yeah. It's very rude. <laughs> 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 but everyone who participated just flipped it and made some money, or not flipped it, but um, the, the top keys changed hands. Uh, just a few of them changed hands for, I think one was just around $20,000. So it, um, the prestige and being an early founder, just, that, that was a great, that's creative uh, use case, and there, I'm sure there are very many. Um, Gabby, do you want to explain a little about how battle rates are going to be pre sale Okay, so when we uh, when we did the pre-sale for Battle Racers, we wanted to make sure that we lined up all the partners so that we can have a very strong sale. The hardest part about uh, a sale is actually having a community that's actually excited to buy what you have to offer. So you see a lot of these pre-sales that end up doing something like $5,000 because they, they launched the sale without thinking about drumming up the interest. So we made sure that we had strong partners from Decentraland, of course, which was uh, hosting our game, uh, from Axie Infinity, where I've been very active part of the player base, but also those, uh, those crypto networks from other uh, other services that we use. So for example, Nifty Gateway, Kyber Network, Loom Network, all of them really helped us kind of spread the word out that this was a legit sale. People knew uh, that uh, this is a real game. And once they were in our community, in our Discord, they could play the beta of the game and they could, saw, they could see that it worked. So that was pretty successful. So we ended up selling around 600 liter worth of items to, to our community base. And having them own a piece of your asset is actually very different than just hanging out in your Discord. Now your futures are kind of tied together. People are more invested in the outcome of your game. And done correctly, this is something that really strengthens the, the community around your game. I think it's really important to note that um, both from Margaret's experience and Debbie's experience, like uh, the games we do that make blockchain games um, you need to really think hard on what these NFTs have in value and what it means to the community that they hold. Um, and that's uh, a big part of making a blockchain game as well. Um, so, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, I think um, I have a few more common questions, but I think uh, with the time, I'd like to go into some specific questions for uh, individuals. So. First with that, Devin, um, so NFT Marketplace seems like a gamified version of DeFi in a sense. I think we were uh, tapping that a bit too. Um, can you compare with crypto exchanges and NFT Marketplaces? Yeah, so I think the easiest way is to, to understand the difference between an exchange and a marketplace is just think about uh, an exchange like Binance or a stock exchange. It's a financial, it's a place where you go to uh, trade uh, fungible assets and the marketplace is more like an eBay where you have browsable uh, items, there's many different types of auctions. So on OpenSea we support Dutch auctions, which um, is a declining price auction. We support fixed price auctions, eBay style auctions where um, you start at a bid price and then goes to the highest bidder. So it's a much more um, sort of mainstream audience that would participate in this sort of marketplace than necessarily like the, the trader kind of audience that would be uh, using the exchange. Um, was that, was there one that? Yes, um, but do you, are, are there any differences between people who 
were trading tokens on exchanges and people were trading NFTs? Yeah, I think the the segments look pretty different. So I would say somewhat anecdotally that the folks who are using blockchain games are kind of a mixture of people who were interested in the technology and probably participated in some of the crypto boom of 2017, but also are, have some gaming interest. Um, so it's kind of this interesting overlap. Uh, but it, right now, it's, it is a very small niche. Uh, and because these games are somewhat difficult to onboard onto, they require having a wallet typically, um, you do get sort of a, a very techie crowd. Uh, who has some blockchain knowledge at the moment. But I think the challenge for the industry as a whole is to cross over from that early author segment into a more mainstream um, consumer base. Cool. Um, and next one goes to Jay. Um, so I've been playing your slides quite a bit, uh, you know that. And, uh, and recently you've, uh, you're shipping out Clayton Knights. Right? So, um, I think it would be good for the audience to understand what the differences are. Um, yeah, sure. Um, actually, a week, uh, we announced about the Titan Knights, but not only for the Titan, we are considering the multiple platforms, so, such as uh, Ethereum or Tron or something like that. The, the, the major difference between those two, meaning that the EOS Knights and the others, um, is like this. So, if I say that EOS Knights is a full chain blockchain game, that uh, the others, you can say, oh, we can only say that it, has a, it is a hybrid, hybrid blockchain game. Um, here's the thing. When we uh, run the, the EOS Knights for the last six months, we realized that it is really hard to scale. Meaning that uh, we want a lot of people play the blockchain game and enjoy the blockchain game and experience the blockchain game. But it was really hard. I think almost of almost of people here maybe know about the answer because uh, EOS blockchain game is really hard to play at the moment. I think future it can be solved, but at the moment, some players should make some EOS account first and then link that EOS account into the, the, the game and then they can play. So it is really hard to play to uh, general mass users. So we realized that it's really hard to uh, scale up the, the game itself. So we decided to make some kind of game without any kind of this procedure, meaning that if the uh, or the Clayton or the Ethereum or something like that game, we can uh, try to make some user can play with the uh, uh, user can just sign up with uh, such as a Facebook sign up or something like that. So they just sign up with the Facebook, they can play the game. That's all. So that's the major difference. So the difference comes from our uh, difficulties on the years times, the operation of the years times. Yeah, I think it would be good if you had another session somewhere talking about the distribution yeah. network and the blockchain. Oh, thanks for that. Uh, Marguerite, um, so what is important for building a blockchain game and how does the blockade differentiate itself from other blockchain game studios? Uh, so my background in the space, I've been in the crypto space since 2014. I made one of the first token games on Ethereum and back then. And so I learned firsthand where the massive drop off is when you ask users to interact with any game blockchain. Um, so my goal with blockchain was to create, now that the technology had basically just gotten to a point where we could have this onboarding, free to play, frictionless blockchain user experience, I wanted to build that platform. Um, so similarly, like you can, uh, through Facebook login, uh, to password, username, and start playing and accumulating NFTs. Um, so for me, like in order to really, I guess, bridge out into the mainstream markets, we have to build with that in mind. Um, asking users to download other components, such as a wallet, you're going to lose 90%, if not more, 99% of people. Because people don't want to do an additional step. You have to limit that sign up process to be as simple as possible. Um, and then once they have the NFTs in their inventory and they have any value at all, you're going to be hooking people um, and teaching them about crypto because that's the educational hook where then they're going to learn about all these other assets and games 
and be really interested in the proposition of crypto assets. Oh, I like, haven't seen haven't seen your game. There's a lot of the gaming universe that surrounds the, the cyberpunk and how it resolves um, in uh, a lot of the, uh, the game aspects regarding blockchain into it. I think it's uh, something that everyone in the audience should have a look and see you into it as well. Um, just real quick, uh, to add to that, our game designers come from the traditional space, have designed uh, games from companies such as Upper Dead, Prisons of the Coast. So when I told them we wanted to make this game with an open game economy, they sat down and really had to think about this for about four months. <laughs> so, um, and I'm really proud of the design we tapped into taking inspiration from Summoner's War, from Final Fantasy Tactics, from Darkest Dungeon, and we spent a year just on game design alongside the games for top sound development to support that open economy so that players can create value over time and we're not going to have an like, inflationary market, which is really important when you're thinking about being player first. That's, that's great. Um, we're running out of time, so uh, the next question goes to Danny. Um, so, uh, you're working for engine, so like, how can blockchain games give you benefit from engine? Um, I think there are a few points. Um, first is blockchain game studios, if you were to use engine, it's very easy to implement. Like our team really worked on the process so that being able to implement a blockchain into your game would be very easy and simple. Um, maybe in a matter of hours or days. Um, I think second is also the fundraising part. I think you mentioned earlier, a lot of times, unless you're backed by a huge like VC or another company, uh, these indie game developers have a hard time creating a proper game because they lack revenue or they don't have any funding. But being able to pre-sell your items and gain, um, I guess, gain, gain funding for that, uh, they can um, finish developing their game. And like you mentioned earlier, they don't, nowadays, like engine platform on companies, they don't just create MD pumps and NFTs, they get very creative with the gameplay. Um, for example, you mentioned the key, we have like a founder's token where if you participate in pre-sale, you'll have access to like A, B, C, or you'll you know, receive a special entry ticket or an item later on. And I think one of our strengths is multiverse. As I mentioned earlier, all the engine platform games they can collaborate together so that a game either used in game A can also be used in game B and it can also be used in game C. And that's very effective because it helps game um, companies collaborate together to make a more fun, engaging gameplay. Um, it also brings more community together, which also helps to, I guess, um, uh, I guess extend the game's life, game lifespan. As we know, a lot of times it's hard for games to really um, last for more than like a year or even two years. But um, these game companies working together to like engage in I mean to interact with multiverse, you know, creating a fun gameplay, it, it brings more users and helps the community grow in user retention. So I guess if, it, if there's a blockchain game studio out there that's thinking of making one then they should kind of contact you. Definitely, yeah. Right. So Gabby, um so um for you, so you're running a game studio and a platform. So could you explain a little more on the platform side? So what is Auto.io thinking of doing in the future? Okay, so how we worked, uh, wanted to start Auto was to be in a similar train of thought as Andrew. We wanted to help game developers coming from the more traditional space put blockchain game items or put blockchain in their games, in their game economies. And we spent a lot of time talking to people in the game space uh, about that. And what we realized is that they, uh, most of them are not yet ready to make that leap. They have to wrap their head around what blockchain is, how it can help them. So now we've been trying experiments about how it can be put blockchain around games that don't have to drastically alter the way that the game is made. So there may be things like, uh, for example, Jay talked about payment, but not just payment, payouts, for example. If someone were to receive money from the result of a game, then it's something that blockchain can do really well. Immutable records, for example, uh, do we need a record of what exactly happened in a game? That is something that blockchain does really well uh, as well. Uh, there's things like provenance. Uh, someone talked about what if this famous celebrity held this NFT and we could prove that this celebrity was owned, by, uh, with this NFT was owned by this celebrity, then that would prove value to this particular NFT. So there are things that you can do in the game without uh, really altering 
the, the economy of the game or the design that much. And these are the themes that we're playing with right now. So, blockchain um, solutions to traditional games that are, that, are, that are out there. Yes, and I think in doing that, then it would open the minds of game developers further into what blockchain can do for their economy. But let's make it work for their current games and prove that it has a solid use case. Um, so that's all the questions I prepared today. Um, we have about two minutes and 30 seconds left. Um, are there any questions from um, over there? Uh, hi everyone. So first of all, like, I'm not a gamer, so I'm really sorry if my question doesn't make any sense. Um, so like, when you're talking about, you know, you said like the main normal games versus blockchain games, what's the difference between both of them? So like clearly say like you know payment and you know like ownership of assets and ownership of data. So for me right now I think we see games are like you know one forty one hundred forty billion dollars market. That's not heard of any issue like where people are facing any issue related to payment or people are you know having issue related to the you know ownerships or you know ownership of data or something like that. So in that regard also I like for me on the blockchain in, in social media blockchain in print that totally makes sense. But like right now I still don't have like like uh, that much faith, like why is still blockchain in games? And secondly, for the Tenderly, she was saying like, you know, multiverse. Uh, so for me right now, like, yeah, engine is the one, you know, so all the games on engine platform, yeah, they can, you know, the users can exchange those assets to each other. But like, isn't it uh, the you know, beauty of blockchain only? What if, you know, like, Unity comes up, like, you know, Unity can also do that, like, instead of blockchain, normal platforms can also, like, put the to the game, to on our platform, they can do the same in their assets also. So again, uh, is it only the beauty of blockchain or anyone can do that? You know, so? uh, I'll address the first question. There's actually a huge issue around trading assets around games that are basically owned in user accounts. And your uh, your EULA says that you cannot actually trade them. And you don't actually own them, right? They are instances owned by the game company. Still, people want to trade them, so people do like gray market, black market things like, for example, selling your account on eBay, which is actually uh, uh, prohibited, but people still do it because they want to make money from the value that they've created in the game. So it's easy to get cheated out of this because there's no good way to trade assets across games, which are mostly not allowed by the creators of the games themselves. But it happens anyway. Right, and the second part, for most of our sign-ups, I think it's, a multiverse has to attempt in the past from what I understand. But it's blockchain technology that really makes it possible because if you think about it, if you want to use like a StarCraft item in like a niche, that means the whole like company server, there's like a centralized entity that has to take control over it. Whereas for most of on blockchain, the users own the item, let's just say depending on gameplay, anyone, if they just use the proper, the, the right standard, they can, you know, make it drop with like anything. There's much more possibility. Any, any other questions? Oh, I think we're done with time. One, one question. Yeah. I think this is going to be the last question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Apple 
좀 드리게 한 번만 질문해 주셨습니까? 그 이게 그 되게 어려운 질문을 하신 게 맞아요. 그러니까 되게 어려운 질문을 하신 게 맞는데 이게 돌아가 생각을 해보면 이게 저희가 게임을 개발하고 있다는 거를 좀 잊으면 안 되는 것 같아요. 이게 레스터더 그러니까 구글이나 애플은 플랫폼이잖아요. 플랫폼이 이제 여러 가지 플랫폼에서 주는 주요 기능들 때문에 이제 새로운 형태의 게임이 거기 올라갈 수 없어서 레스터더 쇼링이 안 되는 부분이 분명히 있는데 그거를 이제 플랫폼이랑 싸우나 간다는 이런 생각을 한다기보다는 어, 거기 올라가지 못하지만 블록체인 게임이 기존 게임이 못 주는 새로운 재미를 줄수 있으면 유저가 거기에 대한 어트랙션을 느낄 거고 그게 플랫폼을 바꾸게 하든지 새로운 플랫폼을 탄생하게 하든지 하는 게 레스터뱅션으로 가는 방향일 것 같아요. 근데 이제 그거를 뭐 아주 마이너한 택지를 써서 구글 플레이스토어 올라간다든지 에스토어 올라간다든지 이런 것들이 이제 케이스 바이 케이스로 할 수는 있겠는데 저는 궁극적으로 장기적으로는 그런 형태로 블록체인 게임이 기존의 트레이션 게임이 못 주는 재미를 그렇게 테크놀로지를 통해서 줄때 유저가 그걸 원할 거고 그러면 플랫폼이 지금 기존에 있는 플랫폼이 해결권지를 받아야 되는 아니면 그런 플랫폼이 나오고 그렇게 변화해 가야 되겠다라고 생각을 하고 있습니다. 위치죠? 답이. So I think time's up. Thank you.